Hello and welcome to Bay Area Innovators. I'm your host, Steve Espas. Today we are joined by Peter Pusateri. Peter has been with the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, since 1964. IBEW is one of the largest unions in the country. Peter Pusateri, welcome to our program. Thank you. Well, labor unions, there's so much to talk about. A lot of our leaders and a lot of state policies are based on what labor, labor unions do. Please tell us, especially with having only 17% of the employees being part of the union in California, how do labor unions become so powerful? In the, in the union I have experience with, the power is it's the International Brother of Electrical Workers. So we have a hundred thousand members that are in the movie industry business, the radio, television, broadcast business. They're in the utility business. They're in the construction business. And so there's a lot of power connected with the industry as much as the workers. Uh, and those workers elect the officials who elect the officials who elect the officials back to Washington, D.C. So we have nearly a million. We're the third or fourth largest in the American Federation of Labor. Some of the, the recent uh, union disputes, uh, there's like the way of Kaiser strikes and then things like that. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the background and you know how the disputes get solved and what, what does it look like behind the scenes? Well, assuming we're talking about workers that are working under a labor agreement, uh, that labor agreement has an expiration date. And generally speaking, the parties begin to talk in advance of that expiration date to sort of find out what are the hot button issues going to be. Then the formal negotiations start. And in the case of Kaiser, the particular jobs it wasn't the doctors, it was technicians, it was a, a segment of Kaiser that was doing the negotiating and was in the dispute. And that's when you get into the hours of work, the shifts, the bonus money, uh, benefits, pension, uh, and depending on the relationship between the union and the person they're negotiating with, often dictates how smoothly bargaining goes or how difficult bargaining goes. And the key for the union is public opinion. So whatever the union can do to get public opinion on their side, they use that as leverage in dealing with the issues specific at hand. What is what is some of the backdoor dealing looks like or the, the negotiations? Give us some examples. You've been involved in this with IBEW. Uh, give us an example of how negotiations actually happens in the in the room. The answer to that may differ depending on the unions. Uh, the IBW, myself in particular, we, we have a week-to-week, day-to-day relationship with the employers. We don't sit around and never talk to each other until it's bargaining time. Mm -hmm. So as a contract is, is being fulfilled, unpredictable things are happening. And so you need a relationship with the government or the employer about always, <clears throat> excuse me, always bargaining. So that when you get to the bargaining table every three years or every four years, you don't start from scratch. You're kind of putting on the table, those, those things you couldn't have worked out up to that expiration date. And sometimes the strategy on either side is to save the big stuff for when the contract expires. So de depending again on the, on the craft and on the union, you're always bargaining. The time you're at the table is the opening and closing of the book the agreement, but you're always bargaining. The industry is changing, things are changing, the economy changes, you sort of go along. Some of the contracts I've bargained had language in the contract creating such a process that we talk to each other as you, the employer, are developing new, new ideas and new products 
let me know about it before you do it so we can talk about it. So again, that's power. Please talk to us about the, the contract you have put together over there. Give us some examples of uh, what's in it and what does it uh, take to put such a contract together. And that's for AT&T, right? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> this is, a, this is a, a labor agreement that I was the chairman of, but there were subcommittees in this. This is a 600-page book that covers 1,000 employees scattered all over the United States. New England, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, California, Nevada, Alaska, Hawaii, 1,000 workers. And in there is everything. Your pension is in here. Whether you take your truck home at night is in here. If you're working in a sewer, it's covered in here. Everything you can imagine is covered in here. Benefits, vacations, holidays, and- Covered meaning how people should deal with it or how yes. employees are supposed to yes. deal with specific situations. City by city, state by state, so that a city in New Jersey working in the sewer or in the, in the street might get a different rate of pay than the same job in another city under the same agreement. That's all covered in here. And it, it takes subcommittees to get to the committee that finally signs this book. And there are rules and regulations in each state that we have to deal for workman's comp, the complications in putting something like this together take, takes months. And that's a thousand people, a hundred thousand people are living under this. Their benefits, their 401ks. They, they, elect, they elect me in my position to be one of the spokespersons, the chairman, and then other people are elected based on their job craft. And the employers, AT and T. Now, <clears throat> let's go back to what the purpose of a union is, right? It, a union was created to protect the rights of the workers and to prevent abuse and all of this. Now, there's critics saying that it's gone too far. That unions are getting a lot of money from their members and then creating their own power to create laws that are favoring them. Uh, what do you say about that? Well, the system. And the complexity of the system is the government plays a major role in labor negotiations because you have the National Labor Relations Act, you have federal mediation, you have the government that, that is involved in a lot of the OSHA, the, the government is, is involved. And so the workers rely on that government protection that the employers will not break that law when the union is representing the people. So you have a chain of power where the elected officials like myself see to it that politicians get elected in Congress to write and reinforce the laws that protect the people I represent over here, over and above the, spe the specifics of the items of the workers class. You have the Fair Employment Practices Commission. The National Labor Relations Board has to govern that the, 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 the employer and the union aren't breaking the laws and how they're bargaining. So the power is, is enormous both needed and abused for both parties. But it's always about the workers' rights. From a report that I've seen, the union membership around across the U.S. is, is at a 97-year-old uh, low. So it's lower than usual. California increased by 100,000 in the last year. What would you say is the reason for that? Well... The industries 
where are companies moving to and leaving from? Where are people moving to and bringing with them? You look at the automobile industry. We had a big strike on the automobile industry. Um, that that ne negotiations involves whether or not it's going to force car manufacturing or parts and supplies to another country, or whether they're going to be done in the in the, in the USA, and the world is becoming in our country less and less union, uh, and that the strong union now is the teachers union, which I don't call a union, right. although it is, and it has the same protections that my union has. What would you call it? Well, I mean, there's a lot of talk about socialism and Marxism and communism, and, and, for, and from my personal point of view, um, I don't think school teachers represent teachers. I think they represent an ideology, and they're trying, the teachers are trying to instill an ideology uh, into what they do rather than medical benefits versus pension benefits. It's ideology and taking over how they're going to teach children, how they're going to teach universities. And well, you can see today in the demonstrations what's going on about what school teachers are doing. What school teachers are doing speaks for itself. And there's my membership not in sync with that. So right there, there's a split of power. And yet, those teachers have the same protection and rights that my union members have under the federal government and state governments. So yes, but the IBW is, is doing very well. <clears throat> uh, there's a there's going to be need for more infrastructure, electric cars, power stations. We are we already in that technology on the power stations. We're there. Our, our, our business is, is a little healthier. Manufacturing is different. Manufacturing unions. We lost 300,000 Western Electric workers when Ronald Reagan, as president of the United States, saw to it that AT&T was a monopoly. And we lost the Western Electric Lab. Uh, we, we lost them, three, about 300,000 workers. That was several years ago. Please uh, talk to us how a strike happens. For, for example, with IBW, if, if the union decides that they need to ask for either for more money for their workers or for some benefits, and if a strike occurs, they will paralyze society in, in many ways. Uh, has that happened? And then how, how would one avoid that? Or, or can the union ask for whatever they want? Well, again, I, I, I have to narrow that down to our international union. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I, I don't think there are too many people who can remember a time when an airport has been shut down by the IBW. Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't think you, you, you know when all the city streetlights have gone out because the IBW is on strike. Right. You, you haven't seen hospitals shut down because the IBW. So our our. Our, our union is not strike prone. We're, we're strike avoidance because a strike will hurt an employee sometimes as well as the employer. So, so we're, we're not a very strike happy union. And, and I, I think most people would say, when you see the IBW workers out there and all the lights are out in Las Vegas, you know, it doesn't happen too often. However, in manufacturing, it could. California this year has a $32 billion deficit, yet some unions still manage to raise benefits for their employees. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? It's the process. Uh, and I, I, I think every state is probably in the same position. The, the, government, the government has a lot of workers that get very, very good benefits. And none of those benefits are being reversed uh, to the extent that the, st the cities, the states, or the, or the employers can, can get done. 
So the amount of union workers are shrinking too, probably, in, in a lot of other different industries. But it's an issue that the, you know, that the union workers want to know the answer to your question and why the hell is a government wasting money doing all of this stupid stuff and we're getting the blame for it because we're negotiating wages and benefits in line with what wages and benefits are, but you're wasting money in wars or you're wasting money here or you're wasting money. How do you as a senator come in as a senator with no money and you leave with $300 million? I think that's a bigger issue than union workers are being responsible for government spending. I think someone ought to sit union uh, company uh, city politicians down ought to sit like this and have you ask them what the hell are you doing with that money <laughs> you're blaming it on the workers yet we do we do play a part in that we, we can't divorce ourselves but i think that's a bigger issue and i think the workers say that too i think they're fed up with being told it's your fault things are the way they are it's your fault I mean, look what's happening in the Republican Party in Congress today. They can't even pick somebody to speak for them, let alone spend $6 trillion or seventy, thirty trillion trillion. So I think that's what the, the, the workers are thinking. You know, don't blame us. The, the, but yet, they still go up. And so do the prices go up. Any stories you'd like to share about your experience, well, you know, negotiating contracts for so many years, especially the big ones with AT&T? Any inside stories? Well, um, first of all, you have to have some talent. You have to know how to communicate. You have to have values. You have to stand for something more than money. You know, I can only speak for myself. You know, my code was honor, integrity, trust, respect, loyalty, and courage. So if you establish relationships with your, your workers and you establish that relationship with your employers, um, at, at least there's a, a, a peaceful co coexistence. But it, 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 it doesn't always work that way. Everybody's making a deal. And, 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 and the, the industry now, how do, you, how do you organize a union for artificial intelligence? How do you do that? <laughs> I don't know. But in our world, our world, uh, the IBW world, we're doing okay because we're, we're, we're a craft. We have a lot of craft workers. We have, there's, a, there's a need for our, our skill and our talent. We just need to have that kind of a trusting relationship with the employers and sometimes that, that that's not it uh, i don't know where it's going but neither does our government know where the hell it's going peter where are the unions heading today i think very honestly the union workers in my world the eight hundred thousand of them that and i and i think the union workers everywhere except the teachers forget the teachers they're in their own world and we can't even talk about them. But I think our, our union workers today are issue-oriented uh, rather than party-oriented. They will, they will, when in doubt, probably go party, but they're issue-oriented. And if a Republican or a conservative has got the hot-button issue, they'll get the vote. And union workers have always been sort of labeled much like African Americans and Hispanics, and that is, what portion of the black community do you think the so-and-so is going to get? 15%? If he gets 15%, he'll be a winner. Same with Hispanics. I think now they're going to have to include the worker, the average worker, whatever the color is or whatever their race is or whatever their preference is, going to be, it's going to be focused on the issues. Their children, the police officers, the crime the drugs, the border. Um, 
they're tired of this Republican, conservative, right wing, left wing, middle wing. The spending, the ridiculous spending, the turning on television and seeing what these politicians are doing. And they're looking at politicians that are talking their language. We used to call it, you know, bread and butter issues. What's on the table? And it's going to be issue. How do I want my kids taught? What are you forcing my kids to do I don't want you to do as teachers, as a government? So I think, I think that the, the politicians better, that they better rethink who they think they are and who they think we are. Because we're, we're, we're issue oriented, I, now, I, I believe now. And that is who speaks for me, my family, my kids, my future, my country, the border. You know, I live in the Marina District in San Francisco and there's construction going on all over the place. Most of them can't speak English. What's their interest? Who are they going to vote for? They can't. So I think I'm, my union folks, I think they're going to vote on the issues. And, and you better talk their language and don't think I'm going to be forced to be a label voter. I may have been a Democrat, I may have been a Republican, but you are not doing what I want you to do. I'm voting for this person. And the government is a big example of what waste and forcing on people. Part of why a union is a union is not to have things forced on them, not to have things taken away from them. And workers today even in their union, see the government and people and representatives taking stuff away, our rights, our freedoms. So I think, I think our union workers are going to be issue-oriented. You know, whether they're going to vote for Peter as a, the mayor of San Francisco and I'm a Democrat or a liberal, what do I stand for? What, have I, what, what am I made out of? Where is the honor? What are you doing to my country? What are you doing to my city? Where are the cops? What's with all this drugs? That's what I think they're going to do. That's what I'm doing. And I'm one of them. I, you know, I got a suit and tie on, but I'm a worker. So that's, that's what I think is happening. Um, last, I want to ask you, you know, I think there would be no uh, la labor union discussion complete without uh, talking about Jimmy Hoffa. And ah. I talked to you earlier, and you you said you you met him, you know, you knew him, and you know, tell us about. You really want to hear that story? Okay. I think our audience would love it. In Chicago, when I was 18 years old, I drove a whiskey truck, and the whiskey truck was a truck uh, of a the major liquor wholesaler company in, in well, probably in Illinois, but certainly in Chicago. And the guy who ran it was allegedly a mafia man. And I was an 18-year-old kid and I drove the whiskey truck. That was my job. I was in the Teamsters. And my job was to deliver whiskey and wine and beer to taverns and restaurants and country clubs. And I had a helper. And we were in the heart of the city, and we were dropping off our goods and going our way. And I always kept the windows rolled up and locked because we had a safe in the truck where we would put money in from the customers. So four or five guys come up to me while I'm in the truck, and they wanted, they demand to see my union card. Well, we kept our union cards in the dispatcher's office. We didn't carry them with us. So I notified him, go to the dispatcher's office. Well, he didn't. And two blocks later, the car cuts me off and does the same thing. Well, this time I go into the bar and I call the dispatcher and I said, hey, these guys are trying to get the truck and the whiskey and they're doing it because they say it's union. So, well, they're not union. They're not from the union headquarters. Keep that truck locked. 
Well, in a few minutes, police cars show up and the cars go and there's big hoop de doo and I go back to the headquarters with my truck and I go up to the office where the owner of the liquor distributing company is there and Jimmy Hoffa is there because I was a teamster. And I was stunned because Jimmy Hoffa is a legend. I was stunned to see, as an 18-year-old kid, the one and only Jimmy Hoffa. And he patted me on my back and gave me a attaboy because I had the courage to stick through and do all of that. And while I was talking to him, I looked out the window and I noticed the chief of police had his car pulled in there and there was a couple of cases of wine that went in there because <laughs> the police acted like that. And I went back in and Jimmy Hoffa patted me and sent me on my way. And that was my Jimmy Hoffa experience. But we, the Union Teamsters workers loved them. He, we liked them. That was my Jimmy Hoffa story. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, not really. I think, uh, I think that uh, we, just, we just scratched the tip of the iceberg on this, uh, we could uh, you know, talk forever about a, a lot of the peculiarities of bargaining and, and the, te the teaching of labor management relationships and the real nuts and bolts of what can make a union successful and productive and yet profitable. And uh, again, there's not enough power of the personality in the people. It's the power of their position. That's, we gotta, we gotta crack that. Well, we can make it the power of who you are, what you stand for, and the meaning of what you're doing versus I'm the boss. That's the eternal problem in labor management relations. Peter, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure, it. My pleasure. it's been fun. It's thank been. you.